Okay, hi to everybody. Um, now, it's a pleasure to introduce Primavera, Primavera de Filippi. Uh, it's an Italian name. Uh, so, Primavera is a research director of uh, the CNRS. Uh, as you see, the CNRS has uh, invested a lot of efforts on this uh, type of questions. She is also associated to Harvard uh, at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society. And uh, we know Primavera since a long uh, time now. No? Now, Primavera uh, works a lot on legal issues that are related to uh, artificial intelligence and more generally computer science. Uh, so she is associated to a research center which is mainly focusing on law and political science. And uh, she is very much, uh, her research focuses on blockchain issues and how this impacts uh, activities that uh, uh, have to do with all of us. Primavera is also an artist. You notice that we have a lot of interest in on our art in this workshop. So this is one of the reasons for which Primavera is uh, connected to that. Uh, yeah. And she's going to talk us about uh, Primavera, correct me, plantoid. No? Um, which I don't know what it is, but Primavera will explain everything about it. And <laughs> we will be very happy to hear. Primavera, you have the floor. Do you hear us? Thank you. Okay. Yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, yeah, so this is like, uh, this is not my usual talk. Uh, usually I talk a lot about blockchain governance and regulation. Uh, this is a little bit of a different flavor, uh, but uh, I hope you will enjoy it. Um, and I want to start maybe like with a um, little provocation, uh, which is the question of whether art uh, still need the artist uh, in the 21st century, uh, where still is in parentheses because uh, it actually raises the question whether art ever needed an artist or whether it is just the advent of new technologies like artificial intelligence or blockchain that are somehow changing the role of the artist. Um, and so within this presentation, I will start by just going through a little overview of how collaboration between uh, artist and technology in the broadest sense of technology uh, has evolved through the years. And uh, and then I will uh, conclude by presenting the Plantoid, which is uh, uh, a project that I've started uh, uh, many years ago now, um, which is using blockchain technology as a way of uh, um, modifying the role uh, played by the artist. So um, as, a, as a legal scholar, uh, I will start, of course, with some legal uh, premises. So um, copyright law, which is uh, the, the main regulatory framework that is uh, dealing with like artistic creation, uh, is based on three fundamental pillars. So the first one is the author. There needs to be an author to create a work. Uh, second is the process of creation, which needs to originate from the author and uh, needs to be original in, in that way. And then finally, there is the work. What is the work that, need, that then copyright is providing protection to? And so we're going to look at all those three pillars and see how technology is actually changing a little bit uh, the status quo. So first and foremost, the author. So what happened with internet and digital technology is that all of a sudden, um, the notion of authorship has kind of evolved, not to be just this like one single author that is the genius that is creating uh, a unique art, uh, art, artwork, but rather like enhancing forms of collaboration between people that are all over the world that maybe don't even know each other, um, oftentimes in an anonymous way, where it's like it actually becomes very difficult to uh, identify who has contributed what, because everything is just this big collective uh, collaborative work. Uh, so you probably all have heard about these um, social experiments on Reddit where people could just like get pixels, pixel and this kind of like emergent collaboration that came about with that. Um, 
I will move, well, yeah, this is this is like actually uh, some other type of uh, uh, works that uh, maybe I can play it. Um, this, uh, this was the same, it was like white canvas and then anyone with a little pen can either draw or erase. Um, the interesting thing with those things is that, of course, all the works that are generated uh, in order to be legitimate uh, under a, a regulatory perspective, they have to be under Creative Commons, under like a CC0, uh, because otherwise every work will be violating the work of the previous artist, right? And so that's also where we see how copyright that was designed to actually uh, promote and encourage artists to create when we move into those new artistic practices, which are inherently collaborative of like hundreds and thousands of people, uh, copyright becomes a limitation because it requires always asking permission in order to create a derivative work. Uh, and then interestingly, so this is, uh, this is my artistic practice, um, I, I constantly use art as a way of illustrating my research. And so I started uh, doing the research on the legal question of copyright in the digital environment. And I realized that actually it's not just the digital environment, it's just like there are new artistic practices that are actually raising the same issue. And so I started creating what I call mechanical algorithm. Uh, so this is an example, for instance. So this is like trying to create a machine uh, which can be used in order to generate artworks. And so this is very really like mechanical thing that people can write. Um, of course, they have no real control over what is coming out of the mouth of this, uh, this type of dragon. Um, and this raised the question about like, what are we talking about? Like, who is the author of the ultimate artwork that is uh, generated by the machine? Um, is it assisted by the machine? Is it generated by the machine? And therefore, what is the copyright status of the resulting work? Which is very similar to the question that we have today in terms of machine-generated artwork uh, in, the, in the context of computers. And so if we have something that is assisted by a software, then the user of the software gets the copyright. But if it's something that is generated by the software, then there is no copyright because it's automatically in the public domain. Um, and then we move even further with like, artists like Tingeli that completely eliminate the human from the collaboration with the technology and create technological machines that are creating artworks on their own because of the wind and, and like things that are independent from humans. And again, same question, what is the copyright status of the work that comes in the end of this machine? Of course, Tingeli has the copyright over the structure, but what about the painting or the drawing that has been made by this machine? And then we move further and we start having like artists uh, that are collaborating with nature, um, whether this is like with the biotech uh, stuff, like growing art pieces, or uh, for instance, Saraceno, which is using spiders and putting them into a box and having spider actually create the artwork. And again, who is the holder, who is the copyright holder of this, who is the artist, and therefore who is the copyright holder of the ultimate work. Uh, we also had the very interesting case, for instance, of the monkey. Uh, if a monkey takes his own selfie, is there a copyright in the selfie? Can a monkey be the author of, of authorship uh, that is protected by copyright? Or is it the photographer that has created all the contraption for the monkey to click on the button that should, that should be held to be um, the copyright holder? Eventually, this case actually uh, settled to the idea that anyhow, the, the, the artwork was not creative and original enough to even qualify for copyright. So we didn't even have to bother whether or not the monkey could, could own the copyright. But this, again, raised the question of who is the artist and who can qualify as an artist. And then we move into the more computer-generated things. So when we start having like AI-generated works and uh, our generative art, uh, we start having computers that become the authors of things. So there is always the there is the coder that has created the software that can generate the artwork, but who creates the artwork? Can, can the person that created the software hold a copyright on the generated artwork? As a general rule, the, the rule is that if it's generated by a machine, there is no copyright on the ultimate work. Um, but of course, there is a lot of dispute today because people that are generating AI-generated artworks, they want to have somewhere a claim of ownership, either on the data set or on the resulting work. Uh, and of course, there is always the question of substantial similarity. If I train an AI model on works that are that are copyrighted and the outcome is is similar to one of the previous uh, training data set, then there might be a copyright infringement. But again, we still don't know who is the author of this infringing work. So 
All this to say that uh, there is some kind of interesting question because copyright requires the a human author and anything that is generated by something that is not a human author cannot be copyrighted and therefore will be will be part of the public domain and then we have the question of the process of creation again that, that usually should originate from the author and be original in order to qualify for copyright protection but as new artistic practice emerge we are seeing more and more interactive art where the audience becomes part of the creation of the artwork. Uh, we have audience generated art. So for instance, John Kidd with like the, the silence, uh, where the idea is that the audience that is listening to the silence is actually creating the sound that is the artwork. Um, we have like artists that start becoming just the canvas and then having the audience actually paint on the canvas, which is their own body. Uh, and then of course, like ready made. Uh, so what is the process of creation when someone is just taking an object, signing it, and the signature becomes the actual act of creation? Um, and then we have like procedures, which is actually a very interesting uh, uh, thing. So we have artists that are not really creating the artwork themselves, but they are providing instructions for other people to implement those art pieces uh, by following this, this, this recipe. Um, and then again, when we get into like computers, we get generative art, so, which is pretty much the same, uh, except that the instructions are now given to a computer instead of being given to a person. Um, and then we have like the more sophisticated type of uh, AI generation where uh, the instructions become uh, kind of like a prompt. Um, so it's not even like a precise instruction and and, uh, and set of algorithms that that are software needs to implement, but it's like giving a prompt to some kind of like AI uh, model that will then output something. Uh, and then finally, the work. So uh, we can see like those new artistic practices are kind of raising new issues because we have like the pure conceptual work of the work as an idea. Uh, the work as a performance. So it's not really about the outcome of the work, but it's either the way in which the work is being made. And then again, so we have like the algorithm that becomes the artwork because someone, the artist is the one that invents the algorithm for generative art or the artwork as a set of instructions that are given to a particular uh, to a particular person or to a particular machine. Now, all this to enter the um, interesting question of whether we have uh, some new modality that is completely outside of what copyright can even comprehend, where the artwork is not the finite fixed, fixed piece that is generated, but is rather the protocol by which the artwork is being generated. And this is what leads us to the question of like whether there is this kind of new artistic movement that we could call protocolism, um, which is the fact that the genius endeavor of the artist is actually the one that is designing the protocol that then other uh, artists or other machine can implement. So I'm going to give a little overview of the protocolist uh, uh, movement, if we can call it a movement, and then I will present the plantoid as an instance of um, protocolism. And so the idea with protocolist is that the artist is the catalyst. So the artist is the one that conceives of a particular protocol. The, art, the artist doesn't need to implement the protocol. It's actually just providing the protocol to the public and then other people will implement the protocol, instantiate it in order to actually manifest a new piece of artwork. Um, and so what is the work of art? It's actually the protocol as opposed to, uh, or in, a, in addition to the work that is then generated. Uh, and so it's really like the recipes, the set of rules and guidelines that will enable other people to instantiate works of art. And of course, in order to qualify as an art piece, it needs to be sufficiently original, and distinctive so that you can always recognize the personality, the aura of the protocolist artist whenever that protocol is being instantiated into a new work. And what it leads to is that there is inherently like a concept of co-authorship, but it's no longer like collective works as in the sense of many people working together towards the same work, but it's a co-authorship that is asynchronous, which is first someone invent or instantiate the protocol, 
And then everyone that is then taking the protocol and creating an art piece out of this protocol becomes a co-author of the original protocolist artist, uh, because of course there is some discretionary uh, and original endeavor and creativity that comes in the instantiation of the protocol, but because it incarnates the protocol into the finite piece, then there is a collaboration between the person that instantiated it and the person that designed the protocol. And this is this applies only to the extent that, of course, the person that is instantiating the piece is not a mere technician that is just following rules from A to Z, but that there is this kind of space of creativity and, and, uh, and discretionary um, generation. Um, and what is very interesting about protocol is then is that usually, especially with the traditional concept of copyright, we see every reproduction of a work as something that is violating the copyright of, of an artist. Whereas here, the reproduction is not a copy. You're not copying, cop and copy and pasting a work. You're actually, every time you're reproducing the protocol, you're actually producing a new work, right? And so in some way, instead of seeing reproduction as something bad that is like free riding on the, on the work of the, of the artist, in this case, you're actually supporting the artist into instantiating more and more work into the world uh, because every single reproduction of the protocol into a new piece is actually increasing the amount, the body of work that the original protocolist, protocolist artist had uh, because every single one of those reproductions are a new production and that incorporates the personality of the author. And then with regard to copyright, of course, this raises interesting questions, first and foremost, because it's unclear whether the concept of a protocol can at all be protected by copyright. Uh, and therefore, it's not possible for the protocolist artist to control the way in which the work will be uh, reproduced. But at the same time, whenever an instance of this protocol is created, then um, you might be able to potentially, if there is like a recognition in the, in the, in the protocol, uh, you can claim attribution, but unlikely that you can claim actually copyright protection. Um, and then, so let's look at like the various ways in which protocolism has, has already existed. So of course, now it's becoming much more obvious because of AI, because of uh, uh, computer generated artworks. But this is something that existed already in the past, uh, like, Ulipo is obviously a very good example. Sol Levit, which was just providing instruction to people to create uh, works according to that particular protocol. Um, we could even say that, for instance, Jackson Pollock is a protocolist in the sense that anyone today that were to use the same protocol as Pollock in order to create a work will actually be creating a Pollock. Uh, people will recognize it as a Pollock. And so even though Jackson Pollock is dead, it works of Pollock can still be created through people instantiating the protocol of Pollock. And because of the distinctiveness, everyone recognizes it as being a part of the body of work of Pollock. And then, of course, then we have like all the more AI things with like Steigan and et cetera, where we have like that people that can still now create new works because in, the, in their own protocol because of uh, uh, AI. Now, all this to introduce actually uh, to my own uh, artistic practice. So um, as part of my research, uh, I also use art as a way to illustrate my research. So I started to do research on uh, uh, copyright and uh, blockchain. And so the plant art is an attempt of actually illustrating uh, the legal challenges and the opportunities that blockchain provides um, and the implication on copyright. So a plant art is, uh, and plant art is like, I think one of the most uh, archetypical example of a protocolist artwork. Um, so a plant art is a blockchain-based life form. Uh, what does it mean? It means that it's something that is autonomous, that lives on the blockchain and doesn't need anyone. Uh, it is self-sufficient because it is capable of collecting all the resources that it needs in order to continue to, to strive. And like any other life form, it is capable of reproducing itself. And so a plant is actually a mechanical thing. Uh, it's like a metallic, metallic sculpture made of chains. Um, and so the body of the plant is something very physical, uh, but it has also a spirit or a soul. And that's more like intangible and that the, the spirit of the plant exists as an Ethereum uh, smart contract. On, uh, on the blockchain. And so those two things interact with one another in order to enable the plantoid to reproduce itself. And so there are three phases of reproduction for a plantoid. 
The first one is the capitalization phase. Uh, so most plants are actually unable to reproduce themselves on their own and they rely on the help of uh, uh, bees and butterflies in order to help them in the pollination process. Uh, plantoids as a blockchain-based life form, they rely also on the help of third parties, which are humans, uh, which will help them in the capitalization process. And so how it works is that anyone can send cryptocurrencies to the Ethereum uh, smart contract that is associated with the plantoid. And then um, whenever the whenever the plantoid receives money, the physical body of the plantoid activates itself and people can start interacting with the with the plantoid and it, it is covered by sensor. Uh, which can like light and more movement and uh, vibration and so forth. And so you can actually play the plantoid and the plantoid takes all this data from the sensor and generates some, uh, some automatic generated musical melody based on the interaction. And so the more crypto you have sent to the plantoid, the longer is the time in which you can actually play it with it in order to create a musical melody. And then at the end of this, the musical melody that you have generated is minted as an NFT, and whoever has funded it receives an NFT in exchange into its own wallet. Um, and then, of course, this NFT is kind of like the seed of the plantoid. And so you can now transfer, disseminate the seeds of the plantoid on like the secondary market. And every time there is uh, one of the seeds that are sold on the secondary market, 10% uh, of the resale price is sent back to the plantoid as a way of, as a funding mechanism. So the plantoid is collecting funds, but when you send directly fund to it in order to create the first NFT, but also every time the NFT is being resold on the secondary market. And this leads to the second phase of reproduction, which is once the plantoid has accumulated enough funds in order to ensure its reproduction, then it's gonna call, it's gonna open up a, a call for proposal, like the usual DAO uh, distributed autonomous organization model. Um, people can submit proposals about the way in which they envision to create the next version of the plantoid. And um, all the people that hold a current seed, all the people that have an NFT relating to that plantoid, can vote on the proposition that they like the most until we identify a winner, that's someone that has the majority. And that is when the plantoid will then automatically transfer the funds that it has collected so far to this selected winner, uh, who will then be hired or commissioned by the plantoid in order to create a new copy of itself. And so this is a project that uh, I started in 2014, um, early on when uh, the plantoid was still based on Bitcoin. Uh, now that I moved into Ethereum. And so here you can see the genealogical tree of the plantoids. The interesting thing is that uh, I, I created many of them, but I, I didn't create all of them. Um, because that's the whole point is that um, it's not for me to create all my works. I created the protocol, the concept of the plantoid, but then other artists can now get hired by the plantoid in order to create their own instances. But of course, because it's still a plantoid, uh, even if I didn't instantiate it myself into the real world, they nonetheless all are attributed to the general work of the plantoid, which is my own work. And so in some way, this enable me without having to, to work all my life to actually have hundreds and thousands of plantoids that eventually will be generated into the world, uh, all following the exact same protocol, but being instantiated by different artists. Uh, what is also interesting is that from a copyright perspective, it kind of like flips copyright on its head in the sense that um, copyright is usually based on the notion of scarcity and exclusivity. Uh, whereas here, the point is for every artist that creates a plantoid to maximize the dissemination of the plantoid because the more visible they are, the more they are likely to collect cryptocurrencies, but also to encourage the remix and the creation of derivative works because the more the plantoid reproduces itself, the more the artist will actually earn royalty from it because every time a plant is reproduced, there is like some percentage of the reproduction price, price that goes back to the original artist. Um, and so again, why, why this is interesting for, uh, and then sorry, one, one other point is that uh, the, the, instead, usually when we fund art, we usually send money to an artist and we hope that the artist will continue to produce work that we like. Whereas here we can fund 
we can send funds directly to the art piece itself. And it is then the art piece that will choose, that will select who is the artist that is entitled to reproduce it. And so we're kind of like switching, we're enabling for the first time in, uh, in history perhaps uh, to, to fund an art piece itself and to give some kind of economic agency to the art piece. Um, and so why it is, um, why it is like, a protocolist uh, system is because, of course, to me, the fact that someone is reproducing a plant art is, is exactly my objective. Uh, my dream is that I never have to make any plant art in my life because other people are doing it on my behalf. And yet it is my body of work that is expanding into the world. And so, again, the reproduction is the production of new work. And the more people are producing and reproducing the protocol, the more plant art will exist into the world. Um, so I will stop here and uh, happy to uh, discuss and answer questions. Okay, thanks very much Primavera for this fascinating talk. Uh, I suppose there are several questions uh, among the audience, both the physical one and the virtual one. Uh, in case you are in the virtual audience, please raise your hand on the Zoom uh, hand raising so Kathy can see that you want to talk uh, and can, uh, can give you the floor and people in the room if they want to talk please come near here because nobody will hear you otherwise so who has a question I will start with a question um, which is more a Curiosity, no? Uh, now, 50 years ago, Xenakis introduced the notion of random music, no? So instead of writing a piece of music, no, he wrote an algorithm which generates uh, music randomly, no? Would that belong? according to your definition, to a protocolist art creation? Um, so I think randomly, I'm not sure what does it mean randomly. Like, so you need to have like, I will assume there is like some kind of algorithm that uh, takes some random inputs and then process those random inputs into some kind of melody, right? Uh, yes, you have the constraints of what the melody is, no? Right. But uh, uh, there are two types of random music that Xenakis introduced. One, it is with a single orchestra, and the other one, it is with two orchestras, which play one against the other one, using game theory. Mm. Uh, so it is very, there is a very formal theory behind it, but nevertheless, every single piece of music that it is performed uh, is never similar to the previous ones because part of the melody is randomly generated. No? So, right. so yeah, it was a random it's... generator. Of, I mean, you just have to... Uh, no? So there is a protocol and it, it is very, very specific on how this is uh, 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 done. Um, but the artwork is not uh, unique. Right, yeah. So I think most, that's, that's basically like generative art in general, right? So I think most generative art could, could qualify as protocolist art, where you're leveraging a machine to work, to, to reproduce your protocol according mm -hmm. to its own discretionary, and in this case, randomness would be the discretionary power given to the to the machine uh, to express its own creativity, I guess. Uh, so yeah, I think mo most generative art will be uh, falling with, within the protocolist um, uh, field. The, the, the important thing to like, as again, it depends, it depends on the case, right? It, it, if the protocol is so distinctive that you keep recognizing every single one of those pieces as belonging to the same family of uh, works that that are stemming from the same protocol so if it's so random and if it's like the constraints are so loose that it's just like random noise 
that will then be protocolism. Whereas if the constraints are such that whatever the random is, is, is stemming, you can still recognize that it's that protocol that is into play in order to generate the artwork. So again, it's like the, the outcome of the work counts as an artwork, but does it also incarnate the protocol in a way that you will recognize the protocol as well? And then in that case, we are, we are into the realm of protocolist art. Um, if you cannot recognize the protocol because it's too loose, and so any kind of like random generated thing will, will, will be generated, but you cannot recognize that it comes from the same family, then it probably will not be protocolist. Okay, thanks. Midna. Um, just one moment before Mir as Mirren is coming up. Um, Vera, is it okay if we stop uh, screen share so that uh, people can see you as you answer the questions? Is that all right? Sure. Thank you. Please. Hi, Prima Vera. Thanks so much for your presentations. Very interesting. And yeah, I'm just impressed and amazed with the whole plantoid thing. <laughs> Particularly, I'm interested about the, okay, when you created the plantoids as kind of like, you know, life plants that grow and reproduce and everything, I'm curious about the end of their life cycle. Like what happened if, you know, they die at the end of the living plantoids, what happened then? as the kind of the life cycle or the reproductions and all of that. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, blockchain-based life forms, because they live off the blockchain, uh, they actually don't die. <laughs> uh, because the only way in which a plant can die is that the blockchain on which they are running dies. Um, and so in the case of the plant that, uh, that I've shown into like the genealogical tree, there is, uh, for instance, plantoid, the first one, the genesis plantoid, uh, the body of the plantoid is completely dead. Uh, it, it, it is, it, I left it on the roof of my house and uh, it rusted completely. And I think now it's in the trash can. Uh, but nonetheless, that's the plantoid that keep, that maybe the plantoid that has accumulated the, the maximum amount of money because, because it's the first one. And so as long as the, as long as the smart contract exists, the plankton can still live. Of course, like it will not, it doesn't have a body anymore. And so you cannot really interact with it. And so like it will not generate. That was like a previous version that didn't even generate NFT. So it was really just like pay the plankton so that the plankton reproduce. Um, so, and that's the interesting thing, right? It's like we're talking about those new type of life forms uh, that actually cannot die because nothing can die on the blockchain because it's... They're practically perennial. Um, so they might not get food for a very long time. No one might feed them for a long time. But even if their body is dead, they, have they still have the possibility of accumulating funds and they still have the ability of opening up a call for a proposal. And therefore, they can still reproduce themselves because their spirit is still alive on the Ethereum blockchain, even though their body, their physical instantiation is dead. That lead me, thank you for that. <laughs> Sorry for silly questions. Um, that lead me to the next question. Like, what if they kind of keep reproduce and keep growing and then kind of bigger and bigger? Where the limit is, like, you know, where the, you know, what happening is like just growing too much or, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, d I don't know what is too much. Uh, the biggest one so far is like six meters tall. So they actually have grown quite a lot. Um, but so again, this is like the idea was to really create or simulate, I guess, some kind of like life form. So there is some kind of like digital Darwinism or evolutionary algorithm, because the idea is that who am I to know what is the plantoid that is the most fit for its environment? I don't know, but the environment will tell me. And so you create plantoids and then the environment, if they like the plantoids, they will feed it. Right. And so different plantoids have different survival functions. Uh, some of them is kind of like playing on the aesthetism. They are very beautiful. And so people like to fund them. Uh, some of them, they actually innovate at the governance level. Right. So you have like some some plantoids that might implement some uh, um, some royalty system. 
So if you if you invest into the planter, you might get you might get some cash back when the planter reproduces. So you're playing the capitalist game. Uh, there is some planters that are charity, so they are giving half of their proceeds to a charity. So there is there is but you can innovate just like people. Uh, people they have a different strategy for reproduction. You can try to be very beautiful. You can try to be very funny. You can try to be intelligent. Right. Uh, so the planters have the same strategy. They can they can play on their aesthetics or they can play on, on their government structure of the smart contract and then and then it's up for the world to tell us which plantoids are the most popular and those are the ones that will collect maximum amount of monies and therefore be able to reproduce um, and maybe i didn't say it but every time a plantoid reproduce the artist that creates the next plantoid gets to define what is the dna of this plantoid that cannot be mutated and so you can create some kind of species you have different species of plantoids. So for instance, there is one that starts having wings and like all the plantoid, all the descendants of this plantoid also have wings because that's part of the genetic code. And so every time you reproduce a plantoid, you can choose those attributes of the plantoid that needs to be respected whenever it's reproducing itself. And so you, you create really this kind of evolutionary algorithm in which we find out, we don't know, we cannot predict and foresee what what will be pleasing, pleasing to the environment, but but the money the money speaks, and so when when they acquire funds and they reproduce, then they produce into their own species, and then eventually we will discover which one out of all the possible type of planters are the one that will uh, colonize our planet or not. Thank you, thank you so much. That's wonderful. It's amazing. Thank you. There were another question by. Lauren, please. Thank you very much, Primavera. I was curious around um, these protocols in the cases that you've been speaking about are producing like art related outputs. I was curious around um, and I was wondering if there is a parallel, whether this is the same thing or not with people that are using, say, natural language models like GPT-3 and they're putting in prompts to those models. And I asked this question in the context of, like, one of the entrepreneurs that I'm working with as part of my PhD research, they um, essentially, they, they put in, they design prompts to create outputs from GPT-3, which then drive, like, a commercial model for their business. And so I'm wondering whether that would be an instance of protocolism uh, according to how you were discussing it today or whether that's actually something else. Um, that yeah, I mean, I, I so again, I think the, the question is always like, how are you using the tool, right? Mm. So if I use GPT-3 as a way to generate content, but there is no interest in creating this kind of like fabric within it that you know it comes from me right mm -hmm. uh then it's not protocolist you're just literally instrumentalizing an ai tool uh mm -hmm. on the other hand you have like you you do have actually some uh, gpt3 poets right which are using gpt3 and and you actually when you read the outcome of gpt3 because of the constraints that you try to implement into the prompt you might be able to say, oh, this is, this is the poetry from X. This is the mm. protocol of X. Right? And then all of a sudden, if you start publicizing your prompt and your constraints, then anyone else could use the same thing and, 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 and feed it to GPT-3. The outcome is actually your work. It's yes. Because, because people but see the outcome, it doesn't matter who has fed GPT-3. What matters is what is the prompt that fed GPT-3 and the outcome is associated with the prompt. And so the mm. person that innovated on the prompt and created a prompt that enabled the generation of distinctive outcome, mm. of distinctive poetry that is sufficiently distinctive. So GPT-3 yes. is difficult because GPT-3 is very creative. And so it's, yes. it's like, it's almost random in, in a way, but you can, you, can, you can create prompts that are actually sufficiently strong and constraining as to maintain the specificity in the outcome. Right? Mm. Or, or yeah. maybe you just do the prompt and then there is instruction about how to edit the prompt or whatever. Right? So, but again, if, if the outcome is 
in, incarnating the protocol so that you can recognize the protocol into the output, then it is protocolism. And I, and I, mm. I, I, I know of a few uh, GPT-3 poets that definitely have crafted their own style even though they mm. are not generating anything, but they, they generated prompts that are sufficiently distinctive that you still recognize the style, you still recognize the, the yeah. in, imprint of the of the author. Uh, and then, of course, like, I mean, GPT-3 is just a tool, so anyone running the same tool with the same prompt are actually working for the prompt engineer uh, and therefore for the yeah. protocolist. Yes, yeah, so it feels as though that distinctiveness piece is the core difference between, like, yeah. prompt engineering and protocolism yeah exactly and so, same thing with like mid-journey or like images like there is some people that are that are very very specific in the way in which they prompt those uh, those uh, image generator that you can recognize the this the the, the fingerprint of the author into mm. the outcome right even though it's just mid-journey so anyone could do it and yet not everyone can do it according to this protocol. And if anyone were to do it according to this protocol, they will be creating the work of the protocolist. Yes. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. It seems that there are people online that have questions. Uh, there are, Alexis. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to go to Felicity and then I'd like to ask a question on behalf of Piyush and I apologise if I've mispronounced that name. So we'll go to Felicity. Hi, Primavera. I'm really curious if this is a new way to potentially fund public artworks. I come from a place um, in Western Australia and there's a town a few hundred k's where I'm from uh, which is close in Australian terms, um, which is called Cowramup, and they have these very large statues of cows painted in all sorts of fascinating and interesting ways um, to the point that the sort of for 20 k's around there's just cows everywhere. And I can imagine this would be a situation where um, people would begin to fund an explosion of cows. Is this a type of situation where this could actually be used for a different evolving life form or does it not quite fit with your thoughts there uh you, you're talking about the plantoid model yeah yeah no no absolutely uh i mean the plantoid model plantoid is just one out of many i hope uh yeah. it's it's one type of blockchain based life form i hope that the plantoid model actually inspire other protocolists uh, to create new blockchain-based life forms that are of different types. So, and of course, like I think, especially like those things that are like public or common, mm. uh, is the thing that is the most obvious to to want to use this system for. I think it goes even beyond art. Like you could, for instance, yeah. apply the same model to like a a, a community garden. Right, exactly. and it's like okay. Well, we want more community gardens. Let's fund this community garden, and then everyone that funded the community garden gets to vote on the proposition about what's the new community garden that we want to create. So it creates this kind of like interesting model of like crowdfunding, if you like, yeah. um, where the 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 funders are contributing to to something that they want to reproduce, and then that thing becomes capable of reproducing on its own according to a particular governance structure. Very cool. Thank you. Thank you so much, Primavera. And I'd like to ask a question now on behalf of Piyush, uh, who says this was fascinating and he's curious to understand, can this life form evolve and have subspecies over an evolutionary period? Yeah, so uh, I think I, I, I answered a little bit this question already. Um, so every plantoid um, has its own genetic code. And uh, so the first one was very basic. The first one was uh, it needs to be made of chain because it's a blockchain life form. Uh, and uh, the design has to be under creative commons, right? Because otherwise everything is violating the work of others. Um, and so those are the two basic criteria that the first one had. And then, and then I created a new one. And then this one so was made of chain and was under Creative Common. And then this one, I added a particular rules that it needs to actually generate light, right? And so all of a sudden, it created these new species of plant that are kind of lamps, that are all have a light bulb or, or like LEDs or something. And then, and then someone else created a new one 
create like again that had that had uh, creative commons made of chain with the light and with wings. And now that's created a new species. So now if I want to choose, I want to make a new plant or, or I really like plant oils with wings, I will find the one with the wings. If I don't like the wings one, I like the light one, I, would, I, I can always go back up to the previous one, to the, to the genesis, which has only the chain constraints. And so people choose within the, within the genealogical tree, they can choose which are the plant oils with the traits that they like the most, and that they're going to find those. And so you start having a specialization. It's still like there is only 13 right now in the world, so there is not a very radical differentiation in the species. But but we already see like the one like basically lights, wings, and uh, and no 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 criteria. There is one that has like needs to vibrate. So right now there is only one that vibrates. It has not reproduced yet. Uh, but uh, so there, there is like there is an, a possibility at least for speciation and specialization into different attributes. Okay, thanks very much. Other questions, please? Uh, that's all for online, Alexis. Thank you, Kathy. Um, thank you, Primavera. I was curious uh, if, if, I'm curious about the relationship between you as the, the creator of the protocol and, and the artists who then, you know, are employed to create new versions of Plantoid. Like, how do you think about that relationship? And um, uh, what does that mean in terms of um, that art either as, you know, uh, something akin to something that can be copyrighted or, yeah, sorry, that's not a very clear question, but I'm, I'm curious about that relationship and how you think about it. Yeah, I mean, so this is the, this is the whole, uh, this is the most interesting question around protocolism, right, is what is the relationship between the protocolist and the person instantiating the protocol. And, uh, and, for me, it is first and foremost a form of collaboration, right? Which is whenever someone is creating a new plant art, uh, there is a lot of joy in my heart. Like I don't see this, it's impossible for me to see this as an infringement on my copyright because the whole concept of the plant art was designed so that people do reproduce my work, right? Um, so for me, it's actually thank you for helping me creates work that I don't have the time and resources to do on my own. I need you to, to assist me into instantiating this protocol into the world. And to the extent that it, 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 to the extent that the protocol is sufficiently clear and distinctive and everyone that sees a plant oil, in fact, more so, it is, it is almost more of my work than the person creating the plant oil, which is crazy. But because the protocol is so distinctive, when someone sees a plant oil, they're like, oh, this is Primavera's plant oil. But actually, I didn't make it. And yet I made it because I, I conceptualized the protocol that enabled other people to make it. Right? So there's this, this very interesting type of collaboration and co-authorship into those things in which I don't like I can be the co-author of works that I'm not even aware of. I don't even know that they exist. And yet I am the co-author of those pieces, which is interesting. And it's different from the usual concept of derivative works, right? So if I, if I create an art piece and someone creates a derivative, I am not the co-author of the derivative. The derivative is a derivative of my work. So I, am, I have some copyright claim over the derivative work, but I cannot claim to be a co-author. Whereas in the case of a protocolism, in the case of Plantard, I actually claim to be a co-author. I think I am, I am as much of an author as the person that has instantiated it because I'm the author of the protocol that has been instantiated. Right? So there is this kind of like DNA. There is the DNA of Primavera in every single art instantiation of the Plantards. And so to me, this is actually very interesting because I think it's new. Uh, in the sense that it's uh, just like just like if we it's more obvious when we talk about AI because it's it's because we don't expect AI to hold copyright. If I create an AI work and this AI work somehow reflect my personality because of the distinctiveness of the protocol, it's going to be my work. No one is going to say, "Oh no, this is not Primavera's work. This is the AI work." Of course not. It is my work. So, right. So because we don't assign copyright to the AI. But in reality, it should be a co-authorship between Mid Journey and Primavera or whatever stable diffusion, yeah? because they are also putting their own creativity, if we can call it creativity. Like I, 
I don't know what's going to come out when I give a prompt. I'm usually surprised, but, but I gave the prompt. And, and if my prompt is sufficiently original and, and managed to transpire through the output, then it is, it is my work, right? And so we, we see the more obviously in machine-generated, computer-generated works where there is no need for co-authorship because the actual generator, the, the one that used the machine, is the author. In the case of human human generated works um i have a protocol i have the instruction like sol lewitt is a very good example when sol lewitt write an instruction and someone else on the other side of the world implements the instruction in order to create a sol lewitt work it is actually a sol lewitt work it is going to be exposed in a gallery as sol lewitt right and but of course there is also the artistic uh discretion of the person that has implemented the the protocol that also should be recognized as a, as a co-author into this work. And so this is like, this is an interesting relationship of co-authorship that I think did not exist in other contexts. And through this thing of protocolism, uh, enable the asynchronous co-authorship of work between people that don't know each other. Thank you, really interesting. Okay, thank you. Uh, very much to everybody for attending. Thanks very much, Primavera, for this very interesting uh, introduction uh, to the plantoids and the protocolism. So now I know where I will put my bitcoins if I ever have <laughs> one. Um, um, thanks for attending this session.